All right, welcome everyone. Um, we're gonna get going in about one minute. All right, so uh, welcome everyone to the Leukemia Lymphoma Society of Canada's webcast, Progress in Understanding and Treating Hodgkin Lymphoma. Today, Dr. Christian Steidel, a leader in lymphoma research, will speak about how new laboratory discoveries are being translated into more effective treatments for Hodgkin lymphoma. So to uh, begin, let me introduce myself. My name is Charlotte Hall Coates, and I'm the Community Services Manager for the Atlantic Region with the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada and I'll be your host for today's event. This event will last approximately 60 minutes and will include a question and answer period at the end. Since there are many of you, we invite you to type your question and comments into the Q&A box on your Zoom panel throughout the presentation. An LSC staff member will monitor the questions and I will read some aloud during the question and answer period. This session is being recorded, so you can go back and watch it again on our website. Uh, before we begin our main presentation, I would like to share our mission and highlight some resources that you may find helpful. Next slide, please. So at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada, our mission is to cure blood cancers and improve the quality of life of those touched by blood cancer in their families. We offer guidance and support every step of the way. We know the current situation presents many challenges to those affected by blood cancers. The community services team can help. We are compassionate connectors that can help you cope with your blood cancer experience. Please do not hesitate um, to connect with the community services manager in your area. Next uh, slide, please. So last November, we launched our brand new website, bloodcancers.ca. The website was designed with you in mind to ensure easy and personalized navigation no matter your current situation. For example, if you have been diagnosed or are living with a blood cancer, you can choose the I have a blood cancer tab at the top left of the page. There you can choose information by blood cancer type and subtype. The pages are designed to provide you with easy access to services and valuable information in various formats. Next slide, please. Uh, so here are some examples of educational resources and support services you can find on our website. Access free booklets and fact sheets containing information about specific blood cancers, treatments, and practical information. You can also find animated educational videos, past webcast recordings, as well as our po podcast episodes. Next slide, please. So our peer support program is a support service that matches people affected by blood cancer, caregivers, and their families with trained volunteers who have been touched firsthand by a blood cancer and have shared similar experiences. Whenever possible, participants, participants and volunteers are matched based on their age, diagnosis, treatment type, or the issue that is most concerning to them. Contact the community services manager in your region to learn more. And next slide, please. Now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for, for today, Dr. Christian Steidel. Dr. Steidel is a research director at the Center for Lymphoid Cancer at BC Cancer and associate professor in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the University of British Columbia. He has specific expertise in clinical malignant hematology, molecular pathology and genomics and lymphoma biology. Dr. Steidel's transitional research group focuses on pathogenesis of B cell lymphomas, tumor microenvironment biology, and applied genomics. Thank you so much, Dr. Steidel, for being uh, here with us today. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Charlotte, and um, also um, Sonia and the um, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada for 
for the great opportunity um, today. It's it's a great pleasure to connect with with all of you um, on the seminar today and um, sh sharing exciting new research and um, also hope for for all patients with with lymphoma and specific specifically today I will I will focus on Hodgkin lymphoma as, as introduced to you. Um, at, at this stage, um, I, I want to acknowledge that um, my place of work is um, here, here in Vancouver um, within the ancestral and unceded land of the Coast Salish peoples, um, including the, the Squamish, Musqueam, Stolo, Salvatooth, and um, Shamanus nations. And um, I start with these disclosures here. So I um, do consulting for a number of pharmaceutical industries to help them with, um, with the, the next generation of clinical trials, inform them on, on biomarker considerations. And um, I also receive grant and research support from, um, from a number of uh, pharmaceutical industry partners, including Bristol Myers Squibb, uh, Trillium and Epizyme, and I also hold um, a, page, a patent for, um, for diagnostics um, using the nanostring platform. Okay, now diving right into the topics of today, um, I, I want to tell you today what is unique about Hodgkin lymphoma. I will review with you the challenges and uh, unmet needs in, in clinical practice. And I also um, want to um, share exciting new opportunities with you, um, how to individualize uh, treatments in Hodgkin lymphoma and, and talk about targeted therapies. So a quick dive into um, history of, of Hodgkin lymphoma at, at this point. So you see here um, an image of Dr. Hodgkin um, who, um, gave his name to the disease. Um, and um, this publication here um, from 1832, in, in which Hodgkin lymphoma has, has first been described as a disease. Yet our understanding of the disease constantly evolves. And um, 200 years ago, not much was really known about the biology of the disease and um, some, some first and very important insight uh, came um, roughly 100 years later um, with microscopy methodologies that then could describe malignant cells in biopsies and also other cells, um, immune cells that um, surrounded the, the malignant cells. So really a first glance at what the disease actually is. And um, now I want to follow up that, um, that his historic view with um, some, some general concepts about lymphoma and Hodgkin lymphoma to, um, to set a bit of a, of a baseline here. So lymphomas can, can essentially occur anywhere in, in the body, but most, most commonly it involves the lymphoid organs that are depicted here in, in, this, um, in this diagram. You see the lymph system, lymph nodes, lymph ducts. You see a couple of organs like the, the spleen um, and the bone marrow that are also a part of the lymphatic system. And, and that is where lymphoma occurs. So most often, as I said, in, in the lymph nodes, but also um, so for ter ter tertiary, uh, lymphoid organs can form anywhere, and that also uh, then gives rise to um, so-called extra lymphatic or extra nodal um, disease, which is which is seen in in a number of um, lymphomas. So, what forms of lymphoma are there? So today, I am focusing on Hodgkin lymphoma, which um, comprises. Um, approximately 11% of all lymphomas, and the rest are the so-called non-Hodgkin lymphomas. So it's still a naming convention um, from, from the early days of, of classification where Hodgkin lymphoma was so easily recognizable um, through the diagnostics that that was the one group, and then everything else 
was non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Yet non-Hodgkin lymphoma can be classified into many, many diseases. And it's not just this, this one pie here. So that can be broken down into, um, into 60 uh, different, different subsets. And then um, it can also be um, globally distinguished by, by B cell and T cell lymphoma, which speaks to the different cell of origin, in other words, from which cell type the lymphoma is derived. I want to go into, into that direction a little bit more. It is important to know from what cell type a cancer is derived. And if you look at the Canadian cancer statistics on this slide, I just want to give you um, an, an example of how to read this statistic with a view on so-called lymphoid cancers that include lymphoma, where the question is, which cancer is derived from lymphocytes? So cancer of lymphocytes would be hidden in multiple categories here, what is called non-Hodgkin lymphoma and Hodgkin lymphoma, but also multiple myeloma would be derived from lymphocytes. Quite a number of leukemias are derived from lymphocytes. And if you add this all up, you just get an, an overall percentage of lymphoid cancers that sit at, at roughly 8%. And that translates to 15,000 new cases uh, per year in Canada. And out of those 15,000, going back to Hodgkin lymphoma, we, we count roughly 1,000 new um, cases per year. So I hope that you take away from this slide that you can, you can name cancers differently, but um, if you ask the question from which cell type is derived, then it's a little bit more difficult to read this. So now, if we talk about lymphomas, it's really not one disease, but so many diseases. So I um, intentionally show you this table here that is, um, that is overwhelming to read, but it tells you that it's so many diseases that we have to understand that are all biologically different. And also with an eye on treatments, we distinguish these to, to guide treatment decisions because most, most of these um, entities have a very specific way of treatment recommendations associated with them. And all of that is summarized in the so-called um, WHO classification of tumors of hematopoietic and lymphoid cancers, which is a real central document for many um, of, of us doing research and, um, and, and clinical um, uh, treatment of patients. And these uh, books are, are updated um, usually in a, in a cycle of um, six to 10 years to incorporate novel insight that we are gained from research. Now in Hodgkin lymphoma, there is one particular, um, one particular feature that I want to highlight. And that is that Hodgkin lymphoma often occurs in an anatomical space that is called the mediastinum. So the mediastinum sits in the center of um, your chest and um, is the anatomical space of the thymus. So we think as researchers and clinicians that there is a subgroup of lymphomas that are derived from cells in the thymus and that this is the reason why some of the lymphomas occur right in um, the anatomical struct uh, structure of the mediastinum. So it's a, it's a bunch of lymphomas, including Hodgkin lymphoma, so-called mediastinal gray zone lymphomas, and primary mediastinal large B cell lymphoma. It's, it's a mouthful, but it's, it's important to understand that Hodgkin lymphoma belongs in this group that has maybe thymic origins and has so-called organotropism. So that means that the cells stick to um, the structures, the host structures, and um, might enable the mal malignant cells to, to grow into in, in this space. 
So what are the current, um, what is the current knowledge about clinical management at the moment in Hodgkin lymphoma? You have to um, remember that Hodgkin lymphoma overall is a disease that can be effectively treated and leads to cure in, in the over, um, in the majority of patients. And this has, has come with dramatic improvements in, in treatment over the last half century. However, 20% of patients with advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma still succumb to the disease. And we have to also recognize that with treatments that we give to our Hodgkin lymphoma patients, we also overtreat a potential um, or a, a handful of patients that, that we obviously don't want to overtreat, but we have to tighter the right amount of treatment based on risk factors and our biological knowledge about the tumor. And that is a frontier of research still in the field to understand why patients relapse and succumb to their disease and to understand why um, some, some patients suffer from side effects and that we can spare patients um, from these side effects. So overall, this leads to um, the, the unmet need of creating so-called biomarkers that guide us in these treatment decisions. So going into the Hodgkin lymphoma biology a little bit deeper with the goal to, to develop effective treatments and to personalize, um, personalize our, our, our medicines, so this, this means we have to deeply understand the biology through research. And this is a, a, a first glance here. So we use tissue biopsies from patients um, to, to study those with microscopy and with other molecular testing that I will describe to you in, in, in the re remainder of the talk. So here you see a classical image of Hodgkin lymphoma and what jumps out here, and this is translated into cartoon form here on the, on the right side, that the malignant cells, the cancer cells in Hodgkin lymphoma are in the vast minority. So only roughly 1% of the cells are actually cancer cells, which then means that 99% of the tumors are normal immune cells mostly, of, um, of, of all the patients. So a very, very um, atypical structure in, in all of cancer where the malignant cells are in the minority. So why is it important um, to talk about all these cells in the so-called tumor microenvironment? Well, it is important because it defines subtypes as I've shown you in this image of the WHO classification. It is important to be a prognostic indicator, indicating if a patient does well or not so well. And it also, um, hopefully in the future, will guide us to pick the right immunotherapy or target therapy. As I have told you already, classical Hodgkin lymphoma is extreme in that the tumor microenvironment or the non-malignant cells are, are, are so abundant and the malignant cells are not. This sits along a spectrum of other lymphomas where in some lymphomas it's the opposite. Many malignant cells, not so many um, immune cells. See it as a spectrum in which Hodgkin lymphoma is at the extreme of a very, very strong tumor microenvironment. And as I said, this information can be used to further subclassify. So you see here in cartoon form that these tumor microenvironments, they look very different. So in some, in, in some subtypes, we have lots of normal B cells. Then we just have varying amounts of these malignant cells. We have macrophages, we have T cells, all kinds of immune cells by which these subtypes can be recognized. And this begs the question, how is that a feature of the tumor that is beneficial for the tumor cells? Or in other words, if the cancer cells sit 
in the sea of immune cells that are supposed to attack the cancer cells, how do they survive? In other words, if you're in a fox hunt, how does the fox survive if, if um, it is surrounded by all the dogs that are supposed to hunt the fox? And the, the answer um, to that lies in our understanding of figuring out how the malignant cells are interacting with its so-called microenvironment. So here is now a cartoon that um, outlines how we therapeutically try to exploit this immune biology. So you see a couple of, of, um, of drugs here or therapeutic concepts that are supposed to attack the tumor cells directly. So you might have heard about CAR T cells that recognize antigens directly on the lymphoma cells. You might have heard about other forms of immunotherapy um, that are antibodies that recognize antigens. All of these therapies have, um, have the goal to directly hit and kill malignant cells. The most prominent of those is Frentaximab vidotin that has um, seen its breakthrough four to five years ago. Um, and Frentaximab was very prominently published here by my colleague, um, Dr. Connor, uh, Dr. Connors. And the principle of Frentaximab vidotin is that you guide payload. So you guide, you, you guide a cytotoxic agent, monomethyl orostatin E, to the target cell. And you do that through an antibody that recognizes CD30. The malignant cells in Hodgkin lymphoma are CD30 positive. So you have a specific binding of the antibody and then release of the um, um, monomethyl orostatin E, which then kills the cell from within. So that is the targeted therapy that underlies the brentaximab vidotin. And this um, study here shows the, the success of this approach if applied to first-line therapy. So patients who are first diagnosed with Hodgkin lymphoma benefit from the addition of brentaximab vidotin in their outcome. So you see two curves here. So the red curve would be the standard therapy ABVD, four um, agents that are commonly used in Hodgkin lymphoma, versus now the regimen that contains the brentaximab vidotin, where an improvement of survival of roughly 5% um, is seen at the two-year mark. So this is a, a, a modest um, improvement, but a significant one that now can be considered um, by doctors and patients um, if if, if used at first line or subsequent lines of, of therapy after relapse. So this is the first targeted therapy that was approved in Hodgkin lymphoma a couple of years ago. So which begs the question, how do we best hit um, Hodgkin lymphoma? And um, I was inspired by um, a game that my kids play, Angry Birds, where there's two strategies um, to, to kill these um, green piggies. So the goal of the game is to fly in with birds and kill the pigs. So there's two, two general approaches. You can either aim for a direct hit with your bird, or what sometimes proves more effective is that you fly in with your bird to take out the support structure. So that is what is used oftentimes in combination therapy that the malignant cells are targeted by chemotherapy or other targeted agents. And now what is emerging more and more is also treatment of the tumor microenvironment as a second hit. And I will now explain to you what that exactly means. So if we understand the crosstalk between the malignant cells and the tumor microenvironment and understand all the interactions and the molecules that underlie these interactions, we can go in with therapy to target these crosstalk axes. For example, here with so-called checkpoint inhibitor antibodies with um, bispecific antibodies or small molecule inhibitors. 
I will now focus on the so-called checkpoint inhibitors in the next slides. So what was um, a breakthrough um, therapy um, in the last um, decade or so are the so-called PD-1 blockade checkpoint inhibitors, which work very, very well in Hodgkin lymphoma. And this study by my colleague, Dr. Ansel and, 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 and colleagues, um, we were all very, very excited about the, the change in tuber volume of relapsed and refractory Hodgkin lymphoma patients. So at the baseline, 10, 20 years ago, if a patient with Hodgkin lymphoma relapsed or, re or was refractory, there weren't that many good options. Um, and, and specifically after a failed attempt with autologous stem cell transplant, not many options remained. However, in this study, we saw dramatic changes in, in tumor and remission status, which had everyone very, very excited. So how do checkpoint inhibitors work? So the principle is that we go in with antibodies that, that block the interaction of PD-1 ligands, PD-L1, with PD-1 itself, which leads to an activating um, signal to tumor-specific T cells. So these T cells can now be activated and attack or heighten their attack against the tumor cells and eradicate tumor cells. And how, how good, how well does that actually work in clinical trials? So this would be a phase two study um, presented and published in 2019, where it was demonstrated that the PD-1 blockade has a very good safety profile and leads to 18 month progression-free survival of 82%. So just to um, set a baseline for expectations, the study had the expectation to improve on being better than 60%. So at 18 months of follow-up in um, patients after autologous stem cell transplantation, so very late in, in treatment and usually not so great outcomes anymore, the expectation was 60% progression-free survival and the study achieved 82%. So a very nice Im improvement of outcomes for this high-risk patient population. So I already told you that Hodgkin lymphoma is one of the diseases that works exceptionally well or, in, or where checkpoint inhibitor treatment works very well in. So if you compare Hodgkin lymphoma to other lymphomas or melanoma um, and, and solid cancers, you see that it is a, a very favorable outlier, um, if you will, with a high overall response rates exceeding um, 60 to 80 percent. So very uh, nice indication field for this uh, for this form of therapy. So I want to summarize uh, to this point, Hodgkin lymphoma can be cured for most patients. However, some patients relapse. And now we have new hope for these patients um, with PD-1 checkpoint inhibitors and also CD30 um, targeted therapy. Yet open questions remain. And these are who, now that we have the choice between therapies, who needs which treatment and when do we give it to our patients? And the answer to that and to guide patients and, and um, physicians in, in these difficult decisions, in my view, is that we need good biomarkers to drive these decisions. And I, and many of my colleagues are believers in this virtuous circle. We discover through research, we come up with therapies and novel diagnostics that we validate, translate, again evaluate, and then implement into our publicly funded healthcare system. And then we just have a circle because with that knowledge, we rediscover, we improve our science and, and go through it. And hopefully it is a, um, a, a quickly turn over um, the positive reinforcement cycle. And to give you examples on the discovery side, we are very excited about tumor DNA sequencing, um, a, a new methodology called cell-free ctDNA measurements. We are very um, excited about single cell measurements. And on the other side, 
of um, this um, circle, we, we do want to develop diagnostic assays. And these are in the space of immunostochemistry, uh, nanostring gene expression profiling, and also response assessment. So in the um, remainder of my talk, I want to convince you that tumor biopsies and having access to, to the, the actual tumors that are donated to us by patients, that this resource is key to us. Um, and here you see an image of an actual tissue biopsy and a tumor that is um, donated to us by, by patients. And we can now do many things with those, um, with those tumors. And if we look at what we can do over time, we have made massive improvements over the last um, 10, 15 years. And I make the comparison that only 10 years ago, we were in a scenario where we just get a very black and white picture of, um, of information based on the, the technology that was available to us. Regular next generation sequencing would fall into, into this black and white picture. And um, seven years later, we have learned how to actually look at individual cells and deeply interrogate every single cell by DNA sequencing, by RNA sequencing, by looking at protein expression, and also looking at the tumor marked environment. So we get a very um, granular view on the tumors. And then ultimately, in the last uh, couple of years or so, we can now piece together the pictures. We get information that creates a picture and interaction of cells. We know what they do in situ and what the mechanisms are that, that these, um, these cells co-evolve in a, in a certain structure. So that is really the massive progress that has been made in the last 10 years and which gives rise to better testing and hopefully better therapies very soon. So we have executed such a study in Hodgkin lymphoma in the last um, two to three years, our group here in Vancouver, where we looked at single cell genomics powered by technologies of micro microfluidics where individual cells are pushed through these channels and then can be, can be analyzed with sequencing and also by um, so-called imaging mass cytometry that looks at these nice and colorful pictures where we, where we learn about the diversity of each of these cells expressing different um, markers and, and how they then interact um, with each other. And um, so what is, what is really the, the next step and what we hope that we can do? Well, we have a large repository in Vancouver, there's other large biobanks in Canada, in the world that can be now tapped into. And each patient's biopsy can be very effectively arranged on so-called tissue microarrays. So look at these slides where every dot represents a patient's tumor that can now be stained and interrogated in just one experiment with all the colorful images here that represent the diversity of cells that we can study per patient. So I was actually very excited when one of my postdocs first showed me these interaction um, pictures. And when I first saw this, it reminded me of pointillism where each dot in an image doesn't really make much sense in isolation, but it does once you step back and look at the art behind it and see how the points um, coexist to develop an actual image that is meaningful to us as scientists and, and clinicians. So how does now a specific example play out here? So everything is very colorful, but what does it mean? Well, it means that we can study subtypes of, um, of of Hodgkin lymphoma, where we have specific features here in this instance, a malignant cell expressing or not expressing a key molecule called MHC class two, and how this key feature on a malignant cell dictates how the tumor microenvironment is composed. So in this instance, having lots of surrounding T lymphocytes that express the marker of LAC3, which could be a treatment target, and in another instance where the malignant cells are negative for MHC, 
and then they just have completely different cells surrounding them. Um, in, in this case, FOXP3, and these cells could then be target of a different of a different approach. So this is very exciting work that um, that we did together with my colleague from from California, Dr. Akil Marchand from Cedars Sinai Medical Center. So how do we now utilize these these data? So we describe different patterns how malignant cells and non-malignant cells coexist, co-evolve, and once we know how they do that, we have found in some cases vulnerabilities. So we find the Achilles heels of these ecosystems, and then we can go in with molecules. Once we know that they're subtypes, we can do subtype-specific interventions with antibodies, for example, checkpoint inhibitors, as, as shown here. So in the last um, 10 to 15 minutes or so, I want to um, switch gears a little bit and um, put a very specific focus on adolescent and young adult um, Hodgkin lymphoma. And um, going back to incidence curves of Hodgkin lymphoma, you can appreciate here on this slide that Hodgkin lymphoma overall in industrialized countries is a disease of adolescents and young adults. So look at this green curve here where it peaks. It peaks in the age range of 20 to 30 years of age. Yet most of the study groups that study Hodgkin lymphoma sit in either this side of older um, patients or in pediatric um, practice, you, you look only at the left side of the spectrum. And unfortunately, these two domains are siloed and if you now are interested in the biology and the treatment of this incidence peak here, they're right falling into a gray zone where artificially, at least from a biological point of view, these, um, these patients are, are separated. So it's very diff difficult to come up with a, a comprehensive of, and, and complete view of what's going on in this age range. So that means that the um, doctors working in, in, in pediatric and in adult um, oncology have to work together to complete um, that picture. So I wanna give you um, an example here what that means. So if you're comparing adult disease or adult Hodgkin lymphoma to pediatric Hodgkin lymphoma, we have the unique, if, if you combine this, we have the unique opportunity to talk more about disease biology, treatments, and also biomarkers. And in pediatric Hodgkin lymphoma, the standard treatment is, is, is different from that in adult. It's more dose intense, and it can induce very serious long-term toxicities. And think about the, the impact of long-term toxicities in a very, very young population. So we clearly have to understand this better. And this has led to concepts that have the goal to de-escalate um, treatment in these populations to spare patients from side effects. And once again, we hope that biomarkers can drive this process. We have, um, so to give you an example of how you can expand your, um, your, your, your insight and your, your, your program focus into pediatrics, our group here in Vancouver has, for example, started a, a gene expression study in adult disease. And um, we generated a, an outcome predictor, a prognosticator that has been then validated again in adult disease. It has been attempted to be validated in adult Hodgkin lymphoma and again with mixed results. But what was really striking that if the adult testing is applied to pediatric testing, it miserably fails. And this was a, a study um, conducted with, with my colleagues from the children, uh, children's oncology group. When we looked into the biology of adult patients and pediatric patients and genes that were indicating poor prognosis, or good prognosis in adults, so sorry here, so these would be all the genes that indicate 
poor prognosis in adults, it flips on the other side of, um, of this uh, dotted line, which indicates that in pediatric patients, the same genes are at a sudden indicating the opposite of what it does in adults. So that is a very important to recognize and um, means that we cannot transfer necessarily knowledge from the adult patients to the pediatric patients. That also means that we have to come up with pediatric patient specific testing and, and, and biology insight, which we, which we did in the study just published last year, where we um, looked into a new testing method that um, was performing well in a training cohort to separate good risk and bad risk patients, and that it also validated in a pediatric cohort with very good success. So we are excited about this study we can, because now it can be incorporated into future clinical trials in pediatric and young adult studies. So to summarize um, my talk, Hodgkin lymphoma is highly curable. Immunotherapies have, are, are now approved in, in this disease and have further improved outcomes. But I would make the argument that even further progress is dependent on our research deciphering the crosstalk between the tumor cells and their microenvironment, find vulnerabilities that can be further targeted. And I personally think that um, we have to focus more on pediatric and adolescent young adult patients um, to, uh, to fill the gap in our knowledge. With that, I want to acknowledge um, my, my colleagues, the Center for Lymphoid Cancer in Vancouver, a number of key trainees and, and colleagues who have helped with the Hodgkin lymphoma studies. I want to um, uh, give a shout out to all the funders, including the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada, who, who supported our research in the Center for Lymphoid Cancer. And um, I recognize the, um, the, the very fruitful collaboration with Dr. Marchand and also um, Dr. Nelson at the DE Research Center in Victoria. And I want to, to close my acknowledgement with, um, with a big thanks to all the patients and families who have uh, supported our research. And with that, I turn it back over to Charlotte to, um, to lead the questions. Perfect. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Seidel, for sharing your experience and insights with us today. Um, so it's now time for our question and answer period. If you haven't already done so, uh, please make sure to um, post your questions in the Q&A box um, in your Zoom panel. And uh, we're going to try our best to get to as many of those questions um, as possible. And then we also had some questions come in um, prior to this webcast. So um, to get us started with questions, um, can you talk a little bit about what potential options could be for someone who's maybe relapsed twice from Hodgkin's lymphoma? Sure, um, thanks very much for that question. Um, as, as I have alluded to, the, the prognosis unfortunately deteriorates every every time a, a relapse occurs. And unfortunately, also the armamentarium of, of, of options is getting, is getting narrower. And that's, that, that is because we want to treat cancer cells with therapies that the, the malignant cells haven't grown resistant to. Um, and a, a number of the options and treatments that I've, that, that I've showed you today, Brintaximab, the Dotin 1, checkpoint inhibitors like pembrolizumab, nivolumab being, being the other. So these, these therapies are, are very effective at, at, at relapse and later relapses as well. So they, they try to to move up these therapies more and more into frontline, but at the moment they are they're most used for relapse refractory Hodgkin lymphoma 
um, patients and um, most of the clinical trials are, are, are showing great, great success um, there. So again, brentaximab, pedotin, nivolumab, pembrolizumab. And then there is um, CAR T cells that, um, that are really at the frontier of what, we, of what we can do, another form of immunotherapy that, um, that, has, that has the goal to, um, to, to eradicate the, the cancer cells through, through, through hyperactive and, um, and, and very targeted T cells that, um, uh, that, that, that eradicate the, the, the malignant cells. So this is um, not broadly available yet um, in, in Canada, but um, I, I would I would suggest to to talk to your um, treating physician to to talk about the the state of the art and 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 options that that exist um, already through clinical trials in Canada. Wonderful, thank you. So you uh you touched actually a little bit about the next question. So someone was asking about CAR T cell therapy. Um, they say it's, they know it's used for, um, you know, different types of Hodge or sorry, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, you know, how do you see that being used here in Canada for Hodgkin's lymphoma? And is that something that we can expect in the, the near future? Yeah, so that's a, that's a, a, a great point. At the moment, the, the most success is seen with um, so-called CD19 cars. So um, CD19 is, is a, um, an express protein on, on B cells, uh, mostly on non-Hodgkin lymphomas, for, for example, mantle cell lymphoma, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, um, follicular lymphoma, um, not so much on, on Hodgkin lymphomas, unfortunately. So Hodgkin lymphomas are mostly negative for, for this important marker. That, that means that uh, CD19 cars do not um, work on, on Hodgkin lymphoma, but there's other um, studies that are currently ongoing that use alternative so-called antigens. And um, um, that, that, is, that is something to be, to be, to be considered, but um, the, the person who answered or asked the question is right. It's, it's not the the standard CD19 car approach that is widely or more widely available at the moment. So there, um, I, I might have to put the brakes on a little bit. It's it's uh, the frontier of research right now, and we are hoping that if that accelerates, there's also options for Hodgkin lymphoma. All right, great, thank you. Um, so someone um, again asked a similar question to the first one, but they're asking specifically about relapse after a stem cell transplant. Sort of what's you know, what's sort of the next protocol after, after relapse, after a transplant? Is sort of a second transplant um, available or is it looking at, you know, sort of just, just sort of immunotherapies or chemotherapies? So it is a very, um, it's, it's, it's tough to, to talk in, um, in general terms here, not, not knowing the, the exact um, circumstances. So as a rule of thumb, um, usually one avoids giving the same treatment again that um, the tumor has grown out of already. So there, um, there is an assumed resistance to a certain form of therapy. Um, so usually the, the way is to try something else. Um, and the, the most mature data at the moment post-transplant would be, would be the checkpoint inhibitors, but it, it might be that those have been tried um, before already. So if, if, if that is um, already done, then, um, then the, the, the next step would be to, um, to go to brintaximab pedotin. If, if that has already been given, then, then we are in, in territory where we would do highly experimental therapies and that would be CAR T cells and many patients then have their eyes on, um, on the United States where, where there might be easier access at the moment for CAR T cells. And I see we have some questions that came in um, in the Q&A box. Um, so someone asked, um, is Hodgkin's lymphoma, you know, as curable um, when it comes to older patients? Is there sort of a difference between, I guess, the prognosis between someone who's older or younger being diagnosed? So age is a, um, a risk factor. So higher age goes, uh, goes along with, with a higher risk. 
Um, but I want to emphasize that Hodgkin lymphoma as a whole is at primary diagnosis so there's still lots of options and good option, high cure rates in, in Hodgkin lymphoma of the elderly. It, um, if you compare that, for example, to other non-Hodgkin lymphomas, it's still, uh, there's still a lot of hope for cure um, in, in, in elderly Hodgkin lymphoma, but um, the, the risk is, is um, unfortunately higher than in, in young people. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, so someone asked if you can please clarify whether the new recommendation for first line therapy in adult Hodgkin, um, Hodgkin lymphoma is not ABVD, um, but if therapy including brentuximab and uh, vedotin, vedotin? Brentuximab, vedotin, yep. So it, it, is, it is actually um, still, still a controversial um, the discussion and it, it is it is the individual um, decision of um, of doctors with with their patients um, to, to to go with the um, with New England Journal um, study or not. It is an expensive treatment and um, it, it is it is still looked at from a health economy health economy point of view if. Um, if, if the healthcare system broadly adopts this, or if there is a if there is a risk adapted approach to to switching over from ABVD to um, um, to the the B as in brentuximab dotin and skipping uh, skipping the bleomycin, so it is um, not a clear answer at the moment, and it's an individual decision with um, with the doctor, so I I can't say say more than that. Um, the, the outcome difference that I showed you is is there and it's significant, but there's diff, differing opinions if it's if it's worth the swap or not. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, someone asked, uh, how can I donate my tumors, uh, my tumor uh, uh, to be studied at places like BC Cancer? Well, thanks for that question. Um, it, it as I highlighted, it is very important that. Um, that we that we have this resource available. There's um, there's regional differences. So in in Vancouver, the the biobanks and the the ethics and the consenting procedure um, is is different than Princess Margaret or in Halifax or in in Manitoba. So it is it is important that um, if you if you want to um, make sure. That, that your tumor biopsy is used for research, that you reach out to your, to your individual point of, um, point of care. So it is, um, it is possible to um, participate in, in studies that use um, blood samples. It can be tissue samples and there is different types of, of, of tissue samples. It's a very um, detailed discussion that you should have with your, with your local doctor and make sure um, that, that your biopsy is used. Speaking for Vancouver specifically, we have a, we have a consenting um, protocol where we, would, where we would reach out um, to, um, to our patients to give, to give that opportunity. And it's a very, it's a very high uptake. So more than 90% of, of our patients are highly motivated to do so. And I, I can't thank um, our patients enough for that. Okay, thank you. Um, so someone asked, um, how does Hodgkin's lymphoma affect fertility? Um, you did mention that the sort of, um, you know, age of diagnosis tends to be a little bit younger. Um, so, so what would you say to someone, you know, who's, who's looking for information on fertility in, in Hodgkin's lymphoma? Yeah, so um, th thanks for, uh, for, for bringing that up. Fertility is, is one of the the important um, considerations in in um, in the in the age group um, that, that I've uh, showed you that that most of the the, the Hodgkin lymphomas occur in, in the in um, the age age of uh, fifteen to to forty. Um, so fertility um, is, is affected based on the the treatment intensity um, that that the patient receives. 
So there is, so the ABVD um, and, and limiting ABVD cycles is, is the best in terms of um, preserving um, fertility, but um, with additional relapses and autologous stem cell transplant or higher intensity um, regimens like um, regimens called BCOB or escalated BCOB, which is, um, is given in, in Europe mostly, not so much here. So, so fertility is, is, much more, um, is much more affected. And what is important that if you have concerns about this, speak to your doctor early about it so that, um, that there is um, you know, connection to fertility clinics as well where, um, where germ cells can be preserved and, um, and, 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 um, and used for, for after treatment as well. So there's a number of, of considerations that I don't want to get into detail, but if there are, that, uh, there are concerns um, it's it's never a mistake to to speak up about this early with your treating physician. Perfect, and I think we have uh, time for two more questions. Um, so you mentioned um, BCOP in your previous answer. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that works, sort of compared to a uh, ABVD, um, especially for people that you know have more early stages of Hodgkin's lymphoma? So, so in, in a nutshell, a BCOP, and, and that stands, it's an acronym, B-E-A-C-O-P-P, -P. every letter stands for a different um, therapeutic agent or, or chemotherapy, and overall, BCOP is, is more um, intense with the idea to hit the cancer hard and early um, with, with the idea of a ultimately a higher cure rate and, 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 and less um, or smaller relapse rates. So it is actually shown that um, higher treatment intensity leads to, um, to, to higher um, re remission, yet this is somewhat counterbalanced by, um, by then toxicity. And if a, a patient then relapse, the chances of salvageable disease is, is lower. So there is there is controversy about how exactly this adds up um, overall in, into overall survival and, and quality of life and, and the risk of infertility and, and, and secondary malignancies. So most of the centers in, um, in North America are very aware of this balance of um, we want to do enough to cure, but we also don't want to overtreat and induce secondary cancers like breast cancers or, or leukemias. And we don't want to, um, to have infertility problems, to just um, to name a, a couple, or radiation to the chest, but then lung fibrosis um, and, and, and other things um, or cardiac disease can happen. So this is this is a very, very dif difficult um, dis discussion in, in detail, but overall a balance have, has to be found. And in North America, the, the recommendation is um, mostly around the ABVD, which is less dose intense than the BCOP. Perfect. And for our final question, um, someone was asking about uh, side effects. Um, so can you talk about, you know, does, um, uh, Brentuximab vetotine um, have better side effects than AV, ABVD? Um, or maybe can you talk about the side effects in general um, comparing both, both sort of protocols? So, so um, to, to, make it, to make it rather brief, so the, um, the, the side effect profiles are, are roughly, um, roughly comparable between the, the ABVD and then the uh, ABD plus Brentaxima of the dotin. There's, there's minor percentages in, 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 this, in the studies that, um, that, that speak to um, fibrosis versus peripheral neuropathy, neuropathy. but this is, this is really, um, really minor um, compared to, um, to, to the bigger picture. So this is, this is why um, the the, the, the recommendation um, of using the protection of the Dalton versus not is mostly a health economic um, de decision and you know making the assessment if if the if the five percent benefit um, is, is 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 worth the um, 
um, the, the swap or, or not in the very individual decision. It, it depends on the comorbidities um, as, as well um, to, to, to make that decision. And, and the brentaxim of the dotin can be um, a, a very viable alternative in, in some instances, but I don't want to, to, to say too much and generalize too much as, as it is a very individual decision. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much uh, for answering those questions. And, and thank you so much, Dr. Seidel, for being with us here today. Uh, if you could please go to the next slide. Um, we would also like to thank Jansen and Sijen for helping to make this webcast possible. Next slide, please. And uh, I would like to remind everyone um, that we are here for you. Uh, please do not hesitate to contact the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada if you need more information or support. Um, you can reach us by email at info at bloodcancers.ca or give us a call toll free at 1-833-222-4884. Also, uh, please make sure you check out our web website, bloodcancers.ca, to learn more about upcoming webcasts, podcasts, and special events. Uh, please note that a short survey will be sent to all participants after this webcast. We greatly appreciate you taking the time to fill it in, as it will help us um, to offer the most valuable information in the near future. So from all of us at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada, we wish you and yours a wonderful day. Thank you all so much for attending. Thank you very much.